Hey, thanks for staying tuned for the second hour. I'm sure honored to be part of Westgate Baptist Church. Pastor Pert, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you all for listening in. I'm recording this in Michigan as I drove in today. Uh, the, re the temperature was 37 degrees. I bet it's a little better in Tampa than it is in uh, Michigan right now. But you know, if you go out and work, it's not too bad. Uh, I live on 10 acres. And so in addition to working on sermons and preaching on live stream and I actually even got to lead some people to Christ uh, a couple of Wednesday nights ago at our church parking lot. That's an interesting story. But in addition to that, I've been cutting down the trees that are falling and clearing out the woods and building ramps for my shed and all kinds of exciting stuff. So I, I'm, not I'm not too bad with 37, but I, I do envy you a little bit. The ability to sit out in the sunshine, maybe some of you to play, you can still play shuffleboard and uh, got the great views. Thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to being with you. I think sometime this fall, God willing, and hopefully we'll be back to more normal by then. Why don't you open your Bibles to the book of Job in chapter 31. Uh, because the preacher asked me to talk about the King James Bible in the last hour, I felt impressed to the Lord to go to this sermon for this hour. Now, uh, we talked about how we know we have the Word of God and how much clearer and more biblical our position is than that of our opponents and how confused and, and how much the Bible is a work in progress and never really finalized. But did you know that if you have the right Bible and don't read it, it doesn't do you any good? If you have the right Bible and don't know what it says, it doesn't do you any good. I want you to look at the life of Job. Job was the best, most godly person in his era. God said that. Have you considered my servant Job? He's an upright man. There's none like him in all the earth. The devil came to God one day and he criticized Job. He said, well, of course, Job serves you. Look at all you've given him. Man, he's got everything. You put a hedge around him and nothing affects him. Why, you take away all that stuff and he'll curse you to your face. God took the devil's challenge. He said, go ahead, just don't touch his body. And then one day, Job lost all of his possessions and all of his family except his wife. Job's response was fabulous. Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. The Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Wow. But the devil changed the rules. Uh, evil people always want to change the rules in the middle of the game. Because their intent is not to find truth, but to win a victory. And uh, the devil said, well, uh, yeah, but skin for skin, all that a man has will he give for his life. You hurt his body now, and then he'll curse you. And God said, go ahead. Just don't take his life. Job stricken with a terrible and painful disease. We think the disease of elephantiasis. Bowls, boils break out over his body. He goes to the ashes outside the city where they burn refuse, and he sits in those warm ashes and scrapes himself with a piece of pottery to try to get some relief. His friends come. Bildad, Zophar, Eliphaz. They do really well at first. They just sit there with him for seven days. Hey, that's a good idea. Don't feel like when somebody's in trouble, you have to always explain it to them. They don't get real spiritual. Sometimes we try to get more spiritual than we are, and we wind up saying stupid stuff. If you don't know what to say, don't say anything. Just love them. Just be there. But then after seven days, his friends began to pontificate. Now, Job, I've been around a little while. I've seen how God operates, and I want you to know that he's never put anybody through what you've been through unless there's some sin in their life. Job, you get the sin right, and you'll get all this trouble past you. And Job said, no, I'm sure not perfect, but I believe I've lived an upright life. I believe I've been godly. That's what God said about him. Here are people who have to be less godly than Job because Job was the most godly in his era. And they're criticizing Job for being ungodly because trouble has come into his life. Well, be careful about that. Don't assume every difficulty in life is the judgment of God. 
Did you know some things are just part of life? He makes his rain to fall on the just and the unjust, makes his sun shine on the evil and on the good. And Job defends himself. And as the book goes on, Job's speeches get longer and his defense gets more vigorous. And, and Job doesn't have a problem. In chapter 32, Elihu speaks. He's younger than Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz. And so he's waited until they were done to present his thoughts. And he has a lot to say about Job's friends, but he has something to say about Job. He says, Job, you justified yourself, and you should have been justifying God. What a great truth. In any trial in my life, my responsibility is to be a good testimony to God and to say to people, my God is a good God. Dave Reaver was a young man married just a short time and got drafted into the army, served in Vietnam. He was a Christian, tried to be a witness and a testimony. His friends made fun of him. They called him preacher and uh, evangelist and missionary, and he gave as good as he got. He called those three friends pervert number one and pervert number two and pervert number three. One day in the jungles of Vietnam, he was holding a phosphorus grenade. They used it to clear out swampy areas, and the grenade exploded in his hand. All the fingers on this hand blown off, all but two fingers on that hand blown off, his ear blown off, his nose blown off. His body covered in flame, and Dave Reaver, before he jumps into the swamp to get relief from that fire that covers his body, cried out, God, I still love you. He got right. The one thing Job got wrong. Our text, Job 31, finds us almost at the end of Job's speeches. We're going to look at verses 35 and 6, and he stops speaking in verse 40. And here's what he says, oh, that one would hear me. Job 31, 35. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that mine adversary, and by that he meant God. Job had no idea of the devil's involvement in his trials. All of his words were addressed to God, not to the devil. Oh, that one would hear me, and behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that mine adversary had written a book. Surely. I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown to me. I want to talk to you about this thought. If only God had written a book. Lord, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you're with us. I thank you in these difficult times in our nation and in our world, you know the end from the beginning. Lord, uh, maybe you're going to try us and we'll come forth as gold. Maybe you're going to purge us so we bring forth more fruit. Maybe you're going to uh, teach us to find more ways to get out the gospel than we've been using before. Maybe connections we've made and, and concepts that we've employed will help us to reach people long after this crisis is all gone. I don't know. It seems like maybe those things are true. I sure know you know. And we trust you. And help us now, Lord, empower me and direct me by your spirit. Make me a blessing. Help me to say the things that would please you. In Jesus' name, amen. Job had a dilemma. Life wasn't making sense. He just couldn't understand it. A part of Job's dilemma was, what's my purpose? Why am I even here? He says that in Job chapter 3 and verse 11. Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Why do I exist? And he wondered, a second part of his dilemma, why does God not hear my prayer? He said that in Job 19 verse 7. I cry out of wrong, but I'm not heard. I cry aloud, but there is no judgment. 
What's my purpose? Why doesn't God hear my prayer? And he wondered this, why do the wicked prosper? I know I've been righteous. I know I've done what God wants to have done. And I know that there are a lot of people who have it and they're in way better shape than I am. Why did that happen? Job 27 or 21 verse 7, wherefore do the wicked live? Become old or mighty in power. Their seed is established in their sight with and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. Why do the wicked prosper? And I'm having problems What's my purpose? Why won't God hear my prayer? Why do the wicked prosper? And why can't I be pardoned? Chapter 7, verse 21, Why dost thou not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? If I've done some sin, God, couldn't it be forgiven? Couldn't it be removed? Couldn't I be restored to my former relationship with you? Job 9, verse 2, I know it is so of a truth, but how should man be just with God? Job 9, verse uh, 32, he's not a man as I am that I should answer him. We should come together in judgment. Verse 33, neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. Oh, Job said, I wish I could be pardoned. I wish I could be restored to the right relationship with God. I wish there was a daysman, somebody who understood me, somebody who understood God, somebody who could get us together. I wish there somebody could reach out with one hand, take hold of me in the other hand, take hold of God, and bring us back together again. Why can't I be pardoned? Job had a dilemma. And Job, as I mentioned, made a rather vigorous defense of himself. Now, his defense was largely accurate. The things that he said about himself were valid. He said, I've been righteous in my person. He tells us a lot about that in chapter 31. He says, I've been pure in my morals. Verse 1, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? I not only didn't misbehave with a member of the opposite sex, I didn't entertain the wrong thoughts about them. He said, I've been generous with my money. He said in verse uh, uh, 16 of chapter 31, if I've withheld the poor from their desire or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail or have eaten my morsel myself alone and the fatherless have not eaten thereof. I've taken care of poor people. I've been pure in my morals. I've been generous with my money and I've been spiritual in my motive. If I beheld the sun, verse 26, when it shined, With the moon walking in brightness, and my heart hath been secretly enticed, and my mouth hath kissed my hand. In Job's day, people worshipped the sun and the moon, and they would show their homage by kissing their hand as they gazed upon them. And Job said, I never did that. No, he said, I'm righteous in my person. I've been spiritual in my motive. I've been generous with my money. I've been pure in my morals. And he said, there's no reason for my punishment. The things that have happened to me are not right. They're not fair. They don't make sense. They aren't because of some terrible thing that I've done that was wrong. It's just not right that all these things have taken place in my life. Job had a defense. Job had a dilemma. Why? Well, God, hear my prayer. Why can't I be pardoned? Why do the wicked prosper? What's my purpose in life? And Job had a desire. He said, I wish somebody would hear me. I wish somebody would answer me. I wish that God had written a book. You see, we might say, wait a minute, Job. You know your purpose. You're here to glorify God, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, uh, do it all to the glory of God. You know that word glory is the word doxa. It's the word opinion. And here's what it says. In every circumstance of life, my job is to give people a good opinion of my God. I'm his example. I'm his epistle. I am his testimony. I'm his ambassador. I'm a representative of him. And I'm to glorify him in all that I do and let everybody know how good my God is. You know that, Job. Job, you know you can be pardoned. Don't you understand? I might say this, Job, you know your prayer can be answered. The Bible says, ask and you shall receive, and seek and you shall find, and knock, and the door shall be opened. Come on, Job, that's the most famous sermon in the Bible. Jesus preached it, the Sermon on the Mount. That's one of the key portions of it. You know God hears your prayer. And Job, you know why the wicked prosper. 
You understand the psalmist had the same question, used some of the same words as you. And then he said, I went to the house of God and I considered their end. And I realized they have riches for time and I have blessing for eternity. And I realize I'm way better off to be in poverty on the earth and be a child of God and have eternal life in heaven than to be rich on the earth and have eternal damnation in hell. Come on, Job. You know why the wicked prosper. And Job, you know you can be pardoned. Why, 1 John 1, 9, almost every Christian been saved very long knows that. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, Job, you know there's a daysman. You want somebody that understands you and understands God and brings you together. Don't you know the Bible tells us there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. God became man in Bethlehem's manger. And then the Lord Jesus Christ, never having sinned, shed his blood on the cross and Christ died for us. And he is our mediator. And a righteous God is reconciled to a sinful man by the person and the work of Jesus Christ, and I have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. You know that, Job. Oh, wait a minute. That's right, Job. You, you don't have a Bible. Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Now, that is, the, the time in Job is way before Moses. Job was a contemporary of Abraham. God gave Moses the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had twin sons named Jacob and Esau. Jacob had 12 sons. The second to the youngest of them, Joseph, was sold into bondage into uh, Egypt, and the whole family came down there, and they wound up being there for 400 years, and then God raised up Moses to deliver Israel so some five or six hundred years after Job lived, the first words of the Word of God were penned, were given by God to Moses to put down for us. Job didn't have a Bible. Job knew a lot about God. I always thought when I was pastoring, I ought to do a series on the theology of Job. I never wound up doing that. He knew a lot about God. See, God's always wanted men to know him and always made ways for men to know him. He wants you to know him. He wants you, if you're not sure of heaven, to know that by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can have eternal life. That Jesus died for your sin, and there's not a thing in the world you can do to forget or forgive your sin yourself and pay for your sin yourself, but Jesus paid it all when he died on the cross, shed his blood, and rose from the grave. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He wants you to know him if you're already saved. The Apostle Paul was saved when he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. He's not far, Paul said, from every one of us. James told us, draw nigh to God, and he shall draw nigh to you. God's always wanted man to know him. But Job, Job didn't have a Bible. Job said, I wish I did, or all that one would hear me. My desire is the Almighty would answer me. And then my adversary had written a book. There are 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. Their God has no son. Their God believes that uh, you should blow yourself up and kill others who don't believe in him. The president of the Southern Baptist Convention said a few years ago that Christians and Muslims worship the same God. That is offensive to both, both faiths. It's an insult. No, our God, the God of the Bible, created the heaven and the earth. He has a son. His name is Jesus, his only begotten son. And he's not at all like Allah. Uh, uh, their God wants them to blow up their sons and sacrifice their sons for his agenda. Our God gave his son. Jesus is a sacrifice for us. But the difference between them and you is they do not have a book. And you have a book. You have the word of God. At one point, two billion Roman Catholics in the world. They believe that man can never be sure he's going to go to heaven when he dies. They have to go to purgatory for a little bit. I called several Roman Catholics. 
Catholic priest years ago and said, I'm, I'm doing a little survey. I want to know how can I be sure I'm going to go to heaven when I die? None of them could tell me. They believe Mary is a co-redemptress along with the Lord Jesus. They believe you can get to Jesus by going through Mary. They discourage their people from reading the Bible for themselves. They believe it has to be interpreted by the authority of the church and the difference between those 1.2 billion Roman Catholics and you is they don't have a book and you have a book. There are 1.1 billion Hindus in the world. They think that you are reincarnated from one life form into another. And if you do well in one life form, you get to go to a better life form. When I was in India years ago, there were 750 million people in a country two-thirds the size geographically of the United States. There were more rats than people, and the rats ate over half of the grain harvest. But they wouldn't kill the rats because it might be grandma. Hindus have millions of gods. No Hindu could tell you the names of all of their gods. And Hindus believe that if you do real well in one level of life to the next, to the next, to the next, you can eventually achieve an exalted state called nirvana. Nirvana is a state of nothingness. You know nothing, you feel nothing, you see nothing, you hear nothing, uh, you can touch nothing. You see, they believe this life is such a miserable mess that the best thing in the world would be if you could just not be aware of anything and have a total emptiness of existence. And the difference between them and you is they don't have a book and you have a book. Praise God! We have a book, the Word of God! Job's desire. If only God had written a book. What would you do with it, Job? Well, I believe our text at least strongly implies that it would be his authority. Boy, I could answer the foolish and fallacious philosophy of my friends if I had a book from God. You know, I'm glad we have a Bible as our authority. You know, you ought to follow your pastor. He's a good man, and he's a wise man, and he'll give you a good counsel. But the reason you do that is not because he's a good man, or not because he's a wise man, or not because he can give you good counsel, because the Bible says, obey them that have the rule over you, and watch for your soul. Submit yourselves as the, they watch for your souls as those must give an account. Uh, I, I'm glad that I have an authority in the Word of God. I, I know that there's one way to heaven because the Bible tells me Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by Him. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I know I should belong to a local, visible assembly. And when I'm able, I must come together again with the church family. What a blessing and what a day that will be. I find that in the Word of God. The Bible is my authority. I don't have to listen to what somebody said. I've got it in the Bible. Years ago, somebody asked me my position on an issue as a Calvinist. I told him what I believed and he said, well, do you know that what you believe disagrees with the Westminster Confession of Faith? To which I, as a very young man, responded, so? <laughs> Apparently the Westminster Confession of Faith disagrees with the Bible. I'm a Baptist. Baptists are not creedal people. We are not those who are bound to some statement of faith. We may have a statement of faith to let people know what we believe, but it all comes from the Bible. The Bible is our authority. But not only that, Job said, if I had God's book, it would not only be my authority, it would be my answer. Oh, he said, I wish I had an answer from the Almighty. Did you know the Bible tells you everything you need to know about life? The Bible tells you what kind of a husband to be. The Bible tells you how to be a good wife. The Bible tells you how to raise your children. The Bible tells you how to obey and respond to your parents. The Bible tells you how to handle your money. The Bible tells you how to deal with your friends. The Bible tells you how to treat your enemies. The Bible tells you what to do when you're sad and what to do when you're happy. The Bible tells you how that you can face every situation in life. I have an answer. It's the Word of God. But not only that, Job said, if I had a book from God, it would be the object of my adoration. If my adversary, if God had written a book, I wouldn't just throw it on the dresser when I got home. I wouldn't let it sit and collect 
dust. No, he said, if I had a book, surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown to me. What is your attitude toward the word of God? I don't like to have anything on top of my Bible. I don't, I don't like to take notes in my Bible. I don't mind if you do. My writing is just so poor that I feel like I'm being sacrilegious. You've got a book. What do you do with it? Supposing I could uh, turn this into a Zoom conference call and I'm going to turn the volume on on you and I'm going to have each of you one at a time tell me how many days of the last seven you've spent some time reading the Bible. Most of us have more time now than we normally do. Most of us could spend more time in the Word of God. Do you adore it? Do you love it? When I was a fairly young Christian, I got convicted that I should read the Bible through every year, and so I did. And that's, that's a really good starting place. And then, I'm not sure why, maybe I think it was one New Year's Day, I was home and reading the Bible, and I thought, you know, I bet you could read the Bible through twice in a year. So I did that for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I got in trouble. I was preaching on that at our church one time, and, and I said, I read the Bible twice a year. I read it one day in January, one day in July. I meant to say I read through it twice a year. Then I got impressed I should read it a little more, so I started reading the Old Testament every three months and the New Testament every two months. So six times a year I'd read the Old Testament, four times a year the New Testament. I was in Arizona in 2017. I was sick. I'd go back from the service and just go to bed. I didn't sleep the whole time, but I'd just lay down, and I read the Bible. I thought, you know, I bet you I could read the Bible through in a month. And in July of 2017, I read the Bible through in a month. I've read it through every month since then. Last night, I read through Revelation chapter 2. If I likely will finish the book of Revelation today, and that'll finish my Bible reading for April. Last year, I read it through 12 times by the end of November and used December to Memorize 2 Timothy in the book of Philippians, review the memorization, get them firmly in my head again. But here's the amazing thing. It, it's not as big a deal as it sounds like. It, it's about 30 pages a day in this Bible. I know people read more pages than that in a novel, in a magazine, in some textbook. But here's the amazing thing. I read the Bible and I laugh. I read the Bible and I get excited. I read the Bible and I shout. I read the Bible and it warms my heart. You know why? Because the Bible is the Word of God. Did not our hearts burn within us? The Emmaus Traveler said as we talked with him on the way. Somebody asked Tom Malone how long you read the Bible every day. He said, I read it until I burn in here. There's no book I know that you could read every month and not be bored stiff with. I've read the books by Louis L'Amour. I found him a good storyteller. I wouldn't want to read hardly any of them twice, let alone read any of them once a month. Did you know the divorce rate's over 50% with the COVID crisis probably going up? The voice, divorce lawyers in New York City are being inundated with phone calls. People spending more time together. <laughs> I read a little joke. A fellow said, second day of no sports. I discovered a woman sitting on the couch. Apparently, she's my wife. She seems nice. <laughs> well, apparently, people are discovering their spouses, and they don't all seem nice. But did you know where people read the Bible regularly? The divorce rate is one in 500. The entrance of thy words giveth light. The word of God changes us. Let us receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. I'm glad you have it. I'm glad this King James Bible is the preserved, inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. But it doesn't do you any good. If you don't make it a part of your life. Though the cover is worn. 
And the pages are torn, and though places bear traces of tears, yet more precious than gold is this book worn and old that can shatter and scatter my fears. This old book is my guide. It's a friend by my side. It will lighten and brighten my way. And each promise I find soothes and gladdens my mind as I read it and heed it each day. To this book will I cling, of its worth will I sing, though great losses and crosses be mine. For I cannot despair, though surrounded by care, when possessing this blessing divine. If only God had written a book. He did. What are you doing with yours? Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts. Guide me. Would you bow your head and close your eyes wherever you are? I cannot see you, but God sees you. Have you been reading the Bible regularly? Have you been hiding its word in your heart? Have you been letting it govern your life? I wonder who'd say, no, my relationship with the word of God is not what it should be. You can't be right with God, not be right with his book. The Bible says, Thou hast magnified thy word even above thy name. I wonder, would you lift a hand not to me, I won't see you, but to God and say, God, I'm sorry. I haven't adored your word. I haven't carried it on my shoulder and bound it as a crown to me. I've taken it for granted. I've ignored it. I want to give it its rightful place in my life. Talk to the Lord about that. And let me talk to you if you may be watching this and you don't know for sure you have a home in heaven. God loves you so much, he wants to spend eternity with you. Our sin separates us from God. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. But God took care of that through his son Jesus Christ. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Christ died for our sins. Christ died for us. And that's why the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God loves us. He sent Jesus to die for us. Jesus paid for all the sin of all the world when he bled and died on the cross and rose from the grave. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved from their sins, saved from death and hell. Would you be willing to trust Jesus today to save you? I'd like to help you in a prayer. Let me tell you what I'd ask you to pray. It's not that the words are magic. Saying the words doesn't mean anything, but meaning these words changes everything. I'd ask you to pray something like this. Lord, I admit I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to go to heaven, but I believe you sent your son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross for my sin. And I trust Jesus and him alone to forgive my sin, to become my savior, to take me to heaven when I die. Would you say that to the Lord? Pray with me, please. Pray this prayer. Lord, I admit I'm a sinner. Tell him that. He'll hear you. You can say it out loud. You can say it from your heart. I don't deserve to go to heaven. But I believe you sent your son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross for my sin, and I trust Jesus and him alone to forgive my sin, to become my Savior, and to take me to heaven when I die. Close your prayer by saying, thank you for saving me, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and asked Jesus to be your Savior, I would like to help you. I have a book I'd like to give you that will encourage you in your Christian life. If you'll write us at First Baptist Church of Bridgeport, that's a, a church where I'm still a member of the church, I pastored many years, and just send it to box 249, Bridgeport, Michigan, 48722. Say, I prayed that prayer. I want one of those books. I'll send it to you at my expense. Pay for the postage. You won't have to pay anything. Or if you want to contact us through the website, our website at First Baptist Church is the number 2fbc.com. And then if you wanted to email us directly, it's office at the number 2fbc.com. 
or if you'd like to call us on the phone, 989-777-0210. But do get in touch with us or get in touch with the good folks at Westgate Baptist Church. If you have questions, they're probably closer to most of you. They can help and encourage you in your Christian life. Thank you again, Westgate Baptist. Thank you, Pastor Pert, for letting me be part of this wonderful evening together with you. God bless you, and I hope I'll see you soon.